Hi everyone. Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica. I am the director of the Planetarium and with me tonight are two familiar faces. Uh, if you've been here before, but I will still let them introduce themselves and we'll start with uh, Lindsay to my left. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. And I'm you know, I'm a physics undergraduate student at UMD. So tonight, we are going to be taking a look at the Star Wars universe um, and seeing what is possibly could really exist in our universe and what is just complete fiction. Um, Eli has been working on the show for a few months now, mm -hmm. um, revamping um, the show that we used to have that we would show in the planetarium. Uh, and this is kind of a, a glimpse at what that new one's gonna be, um, which would obviously in the planetarium be like full dome stuff, but um, we're excited to uh, get back in and show this to you guys whenever we can. And I'm gonna turn it over to Eli now. Uh, if you do have any questions throughout, leave them down in the comments. Um, I will be watching those and we'll let Eli know when they pop up. Otherwise, we can also take time at the end to uh, answer any questions. And with that, Eli, it is all yours. Sweet, so um, can you enable screen sharing? Oh, that's right. I, um, um, there you go. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. Um, and I'm going to need help making sure I got the right window up. Uh, does that look good? Are we looking at the Star Wars screen? Um, yes, but it's not showing up on OBS. So give me one second. Um, why is this not showing up? There we go. Okay. So is it just on the on the presentation, not on my like cue slides? Um. Yeah. Is there a way that you can make your screen bigger? Make my like the uh, the window. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, not without uh, not seeing my cue slides, I don't think. Unless I can, yeah, I don't think I can oh, do that. That looks good. Yeah, but if I do that, I can't see my cues. Um, hmm. Maybe I can do this. Does that look okay? Yes. Did you say yeah? Yes. Okay, sweet. Awesome. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so Star Wars Factor Fiction, um, we're just going to run through some of the uh, pretty true and some of the pretty not true um, things uh, that we see in Star Wars. Um, so we'll start off with um, binary systems. Um, so this awesome scene, which I can't help but hear the music from whenever I see, um, is of Luke walking out um, on Tatooine. And Tatooine is a planet that orbits a binary star, which is just two stars that orbit each other. Um, so uh, this is, like I said, this is what it's seen in the epic double sunset scene where he's becoming determined to uh, go on his uh, journey as a Jedi, um, and it's really awesome. Um, these binary systems uh, do exist, um, and they're actually extremely populous in our universe. Um, we believe that up to 85% of star systems uh, could be binary, um, and some systems can have more than two, uh, becoming a ternary or quaternary, which would be three or four stars, which um, is really interesting. So we do see um, that in Star Wars. Um, speaking about stars, um, we'll talk about habitable zones. Um, so the habitable zone around a star is the range of like radius or like how far a planet can be from the star, um, where a planet would have like Earth-like conditions that are necessary for life as we know it, um, such as liquid water and a reasonable atmosphere. Um, so again, this is assuming that all extraterrestrial life would share the requirements of life that we see here on Earth, um, which we don't know is necessarily true, but we don't have any guess on what else it could be. So that's what we look for. Um, so the hotter a star gets, the further away 
the range is from the star that the planet could sit in. Um, so we kind of, we see this vaguely in Star Wars um, as a couple of different worlds um, exhibit qualities we would see in a couple of different locations in the habitable zone. So like Tatooine, which is really hot, very arid uh, desert surface, but does have um, liquid water beneath the surface, which is what we see in the moisture farms, which is what uh, Luke's aunt and uncle do. Um, that would be really close to the star because again, the surface is really arid. Um, Endor um, is kind of perfect. Uh, it's lush, green, um, got a lot of vegetation, um, and it looks pretty much exactly like Earth does, I think, because it was filmed there. Um, so that would be right smack dab in the center of the habitable zone or right where Earth is. I think Earth is a little close to the, the edge of the habitable zone than smack dab in the middle. Um, and then uh, a planet like Hoth, which is really cold, but still has some of the things we need for life, like um, water, although we don't see liquid water on Hoth, we only see frozen water, um, would be out towards the edge, the outer edge of the habitable zone. Um, this one is really fun. I love talking about this one. Um, so Saturn's innermost moon, which is called Minus, um, looks like the Death Star. Um, from a distance. So this moon was discovered in 1789 um, by an astronomer and physicist named William Herschel. Um, and you can see this crater on the surface that greatly resembles the Death Star's super laser. Um, and it's named Herschel after William Herschel. Um, that was discovered in 1980, which uh, is actually three years after the first Star Wars film was released. Um, so that's pretty interesting. I would like to think that the astronomers that um, found that, which were probably undoubtedly nerds that saw Star Wars when it came out, um, were pretty shocked with that discovery. Um, so I think that's pretty funny to think about. Um, interestingly, Herschel um, emits a lot of heat, like there's some type of activity going on beneath it, um, much like a super laser would. So when you look at it in infrared, it glows, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about, um, we've saw we've seen a couple of things that uh, ring true in the Star Wars universe. We'll talk about something that isn't super true or isn't super accurate. So um, these uh, blaster weapons that we see all throughout Star Wars um, are commonly mistaken as lasers, um, but uh, they're not actually lasers. Um, blasters fire um, bolts. This is a direct quote from the Star Wars um, Wikipedia, which is called Wookiepedia. Um, fire um, bolts of intense plasma energy, um, which is converted um, from energy rich gas. Um, so while that may sound like the work of science fiction, it's actually entirely possible and has already been done. Um, not on the scale of a blaster weapon like we see in Star Wars, but it has been done in labs. Um, so plasma is this fourth state of matter in which charged particles like electrons that would normally be you know, quote, quote, attached to atoms um, are kind of de detached and they uh, flow freely. Um, so the bolts we see here would be what's called a plasmoid, which is a kind of a glob of plasma held in a distinct shape by um, electric or magnetic fields. Um, so these fields can be made um, as the bolt travels by shaping the bolt into a shape called a spheromac, um, which is uh, just a configuration of plasma that would make a magnetic field as it moved forward so that the bolt would kind of hold itself in the shape as it traveled forward. Um, so the, the plasma bolts that we have made in labs only last um, for tens to even as little as hundreds of microseconds. Um, but traveling at the speed that these bolts travel, that would be um, pretty much plenty of time at close range to uh, reach its target. Um, uh, also, the plasma that are in these bolts uh, burn at thousands of times the temperature of the surface of the sun, and they could all like undoubtedly cause some serious damage to whatever they hit. Um, so while like the current Star Wars blast that we see may be out of reach with current technology, the ideas behind it are actually entirely plausible, um, and it's not impossible that we could have something like that in the future, although I don't know how necessary that would be because they could cause some serious damage. Um, Next thing I want to talk about is um, like the physics of space flight. Um, this was this was really fun for me to look into as well. Um, so in Star Wars, we see um, very few differences between um, how a spaceship or you know plane quote flies on a planet and how it flies in space. Um, when in reality, they would be uh, very 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 different experiences. So um, when a plane is around a planet, like we like we fly in planes on Earth. Um, the aircraft is subject to a lot of forces imparted by the air that it's flying through. So in order, in order to turn, planes do what's called a, a, a banked turn, um, where the plane tilts slightly to one side. So as the direction of the, 
the lift force, um, which is a force that pushes the airplane up as it's moving, um, changes direction, the plane begins to follow like a circular path um, and it will turn. So the plane doesn't like fire thrusters that turn it a certain direction. They just use the lift of the air to make it follow a circular path until it's going the direction it wants to go. And then it levels back out to flat. So it's not turning anymore. Um, for a spaceship, however, this would be um, way different because there's no atmosphere or air supporting the lift. Um, and uh, there's no gravity pulling you down if you're way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we'd have to create our own, our own forces to move the ship. Um, so for example, this is just a really crude drawing. Um, but if we wanted to uh, move our Millennium Falcon in the direction of the green arrow, and we had thrusters on every side of our ship, um, we'd need to generate forces pushing in the directions of the red arrow, which red arrows, which would correspond to firing thrusters in the direction of the yellow arrows. So if we fired a thruster from the bottom or right side as we're looking at it and the back, um, it would push the spaceship forward and to the left, which would combine into movement in the direction of the green arrow. So we wouldn't be able to use the air or anything like that to um, help us move around. We'd have to have thrusters facing every direction of our ship. Um, and we don't really see that in Star Wars much. It's usually just like a one thruster on the back of the ship. So it's not entirely accurate. Flying in space would be a very different experience. Um, another thing that always grabbed my attention um, about Star Wars uh, spaceflight is that all of the ships, like in every scene, are always like oriented the same direction. So in this image, it kind of makes sense because they're orbiting a planet. But like out in the middle of, you know, like interstellar space, they're, they're not being pulled by gravity towards anything like significant. So they would all be like kind of helter skelter, like different directions, um, except we never see that in Star Wars. They're all like always facing the same upright. So it's just kind of interesting. I mean, it's not impossible. They could orient that way. But um, odds are that if they take off from a bunch of different planets and different orientations, they would all be facing different directions, upside down, sideways, stuff like that. Um, but I think it's interesting that we always see them kind of in the same plane. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is asteroid fields. Um, so we see a bunch of awesome scenes uh, in Star Wars um, of ships navigating these asteroid fields um, and like bobbing and weaving and it's always like a life or death situation. Um, and they're really cool scenes, um, especially the one where we encounter the, the big like space worm thing. Um, but in reality, flying through an asteroid field um, or, you know, one like the solar system's asteroid belt would be almost no different than flying through empty space. Um, a probe flying through our asteroid belt has less than one in a billion chance of colliding with something. Um, and multiple of them have gone through the region without imaging or seeing one asteroid. Um, it's, it's not a very dense area at all. It's, it's not much different than empty space. So um, unfortunately, these scenes like we see in Star Wars where they're flying through an asteroid belt um, don't ring true to reality very much, but they're still awesome to watch anyway. Um, let me get to my next slide here. <clears throat> oh, this one's really fun to talk about too. This scene is from uh, the second prequel, um, which is Attack of the Clones. Um, and uh, this scene is as um, Obi-Wan Kenobi is going to Geonosis and he's being trailed by um, Boba and Jenga Fett. Um, so another problem that we see in space, um, in Star Wars, um, and specifically like space fights, is that we see these like seismic waves um, and sounds uh, when we know that um, no sound happens in space. Um, we've all heard this like, you know, if a spaceship is in space and it blew up, you wouldn't hear anything adage. Um, and that's because there's no medium in space for the seismic waves or sound waves to travel through. Um, sound or seismic waves are just the vibration of air. Um, so like when you pluck a guitar string, that guitar string vibrates and then it moves the air around it. And then that motion goes through the air all around it and hit, hits your ear and that's what you hear as sound. Um, but there's no air in space for that to travel through. So you wouldn't hear anything. And also there's no like medium for the seismic wave to travel through so it wouldn't hurt you. Um, so like the seismic waves that we see here um, would travel through like the earth's crust or something during an earthquake. But again, there's no medium for that to happen. So that seismic bomb, uh, wouldn't really do anything um, or wouldn't do any good in stopping Obi-Wan Kenobi from reaching Geonosis, um, which uh, I guess would have helped the uh, helped the FETs out. Um, next slide here. 
Oh yeah, this is cool too. Um, so traveling through space like we see in Star Wars would be no easy task. Um, so we'll talk about hyperspeed in the next slide. Um, but for now, I just kind of want to get a good idea for like just how large the distances are that we're traveling in Star Wars. So um, the fastest speed reached by a man-made object was 153,454 miles per hour by the Parker Solar Probe in 2018. And that's insanely fast. Like it's impossible to wrap my head around. Um, but even traveling at this speed, it would take 40 days to get from Earth to Mars, um, which, you know, obviously are in the same solar system. Um, if we wanted to go from one planet to another at the other side of the galaxy, like, for instance, um, the journey from Tatooine to Ilum, and Ilum is a planet where Jedi younglings would complete some trials and harvest the uh, crystals that power their lightsabers, um, going at the speed of the Parker Solar Probe, that would still take 462 billion years. Um, which is about 33, give or take one times the age of the universe. Not even give or take one, give or take a super small fraction. Um, 33 times the age of the universe. So not exactly realistic. But thankfully, um, Star Wars came up with a solution to this problem. Uh, they came up with hyperspace, um, or maybe they didn't. Maybe they stole it from other works of science fiction, but I'm partial to Star Wars, so we'll say Star Wars came up with it. Um, so in order for these ships to travel these great distances in short amounts of time, um, they enter a dimension called hyperspace. This hyperspace kind of acts as like a shortcut between points A and B, and in order to get there, um, ships have to reach the speed of light. So while hyperspace is a nice way to make, uh, make some lore behind the mystery of going um, these far distances possible, um, the problem is getting to light speed. Um, so as an object's speed increases, it takes more and more energy to accelerate it to greater speeds. And this just continues as you get closer to the speed of flight. So um, once the object um, starts getting to like tens of percents of the speed of light, the energy required to accelerate them further just becomes like massively large and um, close to the speed of light becomes effectively impossible. It, it becomes impossible. You can't reach the speed of light if you weigh anything. Um, so additionally, rather than launch from low speeds to light speed very quickly, as we see in Star Wars, you'd have to gradually increase your speed as the inertia would totally kill you if you jumped that fast. Um, and that's why in Star Trek, they have inertial dampeners um, to account for that effect. Star Wars didn't think of that though. And uh, if you accelerated from rest to light speed very quickly, you'd go right through your seat. Um, so another thing that's fun to talk about is the Kessel Run. So um, one thing Star Wars did get right, um, despite, despite the widespread belief that it was a misinformed error, was the famous Han Solo line, um, the Millennium Falcon made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. So um, at first it sounds like Han said, um, I made this drive in this distance, which would be like me saying, I drove from Minneapolis to Los Angeles in 20 miles. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Um, a parsec is a unit of distance often used in astronomy, which is just equal to like just over three light years. Um, so obviously this would sound wrong, like if I said I drove this distance and this distance. Um, but what Han was actually saying was that since the Millennium Falcon is so fast, um, he was able to take a shortcut through a dangerous region of space to make the trip shorter. So the Kessel Run is kind of this maze-like region of space surrounding the planet Kessel, um, which is a mining and like harvesting planet. Um, and it's littered with chunks of matter, ice, rock, stuff like that. Um, and uh, traditionally, one would have to travel through the maze to avoid these obstacles, as well as avoid the maw, um, which is a cluster of black holes um, that is embedded in the maze of materials. Um, what Han was actually saying when he said that was that the Millennium Falcon is so fast that he was able to fly right through the maw um, and avoid getting trapped by the black hole's gravity um, and cut the traditional Kessel Run distance down significantly, all due to the speed of his ship. Um, so that's a kind of a deep cut of uh, Star Wars lore that gets argued about a lot, but it is accurate. He was just saying that my ship is so fast, I can fly right between these black holes without getting caught by them, um, which is really cool. And there's a scene of it in the new um, Solo movie um, that illustrates that point. Um, okay, so kind of the piece de resistance, um, we have to talk about lightsabers. Um, while lightsabers are probably the coolest thing I've ever seen, and I want one more than I want anything else in life. Um, they don't quite work out the way we would hope they would or as they do in Star Wars. Um, so lightsabers could be constructed in the same way that the blaster bolts we talked about earlier are with the plasma 
um, contained in some self-generated magnetic field or with an actual laser um, built into the hilt. Um, but the energy required to consistently heat the plasma or power the laser would be far too much to be able to hold in your hand. Um, also, additionally, there would be no way to stop the plasma at the end of the blade, um, and you would be left with an infinitely long blade, which would not be very convenient and would probably make the ergonomics of combat a little wonky. Um, if it were made of light, like with a laser, uh, you'd have to stop it with some type of mirror or some type of reflection, which not only ruins your ability to stab with it, but also will send the light right back at the hilt and burn it and burn your hand. Um, we also run into the problem of cooling the hilt and not burning your hand, um, which would take more energy and space than is available in the hilt again. Um, not to mention the battle constraints of a, a lightsaber that was made of light, they would be just devastating. Um, and plasma as well. Since plasma and light both are extremely light and in light's case massless, um, the, the weight balance would be all in the hilt, um, not like a sword where the weight balance is somewhere in the middle. Um, and that would make swinging the blade and like making sure you know where it's going really difficult. Um, and also due to the fact that plasma and light are not solids, we wouldn't get any of like the sweet noises that we get when you like clash them together and they make like the, the, the awesome sounds, they would just go right through each other. So really the lightsaber battle would end with one person swiping the other and that would be it. So we, they don't work out quite as we would hope. However, I don't want to end on a dream crushing note. So we have to take a look at the closest thing we have ever made. Um, to a lightsaber. And this is called the Proto Saber, which was constructed by a popular YouTube engineer um, called Hacksmith. Um, this weapon um, is a lightsaber with an attached battery pack, which is canon um, to Star Wars. Before the lightsaber, there was the Proto Saber, which was basically a lightsaber with a battery pack that you would wear. Um, and it has a tungsten blade um, that uh, heats up to 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to cut through many materials. And it's the closest thing uh, we've ever seen to a lightsaber um, at this point. So go check out their video on YouTube. It's really cool. Warning, not the most kid friendly channel. They do say some, some curse words and stuff like that. Um, but if you're of age and you wanna check that out, um, the Hacksmith's video on the Proto Saber is super awesome. And it makes me really excited. And if I was a millionaire, I would commission them to make one for me, except that would probably be a terrible idea and I'd probably burn a house down. So, um, but there, I didn't want to end on a, a dream crushing note. Um, so with that, that's all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing and get the window back up. Very cool. Well, I am not seeing, I'm trying to get, oops. The window reset. There we go. Um, I am not seeing any questions at the moment. Um, if you do have any, leave them down in the comments. I do want to ask, though, I meant to text you about this a couple weeks ago. Um, Sage showed me a video of someone who made a more realistic one that you actually, like, glows. No. Uh, yeah. Wait, where is it? I don't. I'm going to have to find it. Okay. Yep. Um, I, I totally meant to ask you about this earlier. I will be watching that right after this. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will get him. Or he's busy right now. I'll try and find it. And um, yeah, I didn't know if you'd heard about that. I have not, but I would like to. That's cool. Um, because it's it's the it goes and it's got it's the the three, which I guess is in the more recent one. Yeah, Kylo Ren's lightsaber. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm not a Star Wars fan, so I don't know this stuff. <laughs> um, I have but... watched the series probably 15 times in my life, so I, I, I make up for both of those. Yeah, which is also why you do the show. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but it was really, uh, I'll find it and send it to you and see, see what you think. It might be something to add to the yeah. end. Yeah. Um, Lindsay, you are also a Star Wars fan. Anything that you are like dying to add on? Um, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what is um, coming up over the next week. Uh, again, if you do have questions, uh, leave them down in the comments, and we will get to those in a second. 
But on Saturday, we are going to take everyone on a tour of our solar system, take a nice up close look at the planets and a few of the moons. Then next Wednesday, we are going to be doing Ask an Astronomer, which we haven't done in um, a little while, where we are just going to take your questions and answer, hopefully be able to answer uh, whatever you ask us, whatever is curiosity is growing there. Um, or, you know, you could also try and stump us. I mean, it's, it's happened before. But um, yeah, so we'll be we'll be doing that. We'll also um, talk a little bit about the uh, launch that's going to be happening this weekend. Um, so we'll we'll give some updates on that Wednesday as well. And then next Saturday, um, Lindsay is going to be going through the history of spaceflight for us and telling us some of the amazing women who played a huge role in getting us out exploring the universe. Um, and yeah, uh, another note to add, we are still selling our Stellar Distancing t-shirts. If you are interested in purchasing one, there is a link in the uh, description for the video. Um, it, all of these proceeds go towards just helping us stay afloat during these pandemic times since we haven't uh, been able to open since mid-March. Um, and so, yeah, if you enjoy what we do and are able to support us, we would very much appreciate it. All right. Um, so with that, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, Eli, thank you. It was yeah. a wonderful show for what little I know about Star Wars. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, see you again next time. Bye, everyone.